Hi, my name is Gary Patterson, and welcome to the third of our video presentations as we journey together through Lent, longing for home. Through discussion, prayer, Facebook, shared meals, these videos, check out all the possibilities. And let me say, I'm glad to be traveling with you. Now, today's Gospel reading is a familiar one, Jesus clearing the money changers out of the temple. But since it comes from the Gospel according to John, it ends up in a strange place, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, rather than in the final week of his life, where the other Gospel writers have situated it. It's as if John wants us to see Jesus as a prophet right off the bat, someone who truly does surpass John the Baptist. And John wants to announce that big change is a coming. Now, we don't often think of Jesus as losing his temper, getting angry, particularly in John's Gospel. But it's a helpful reminder and a challenge to our Christian temptation to locate anger and judgment in the Old Testament, and in contrast, to portray the New Testament as a declaration of God's love. Certainly, the Gospels are about love, but they also include strong words about sin, repentance, judgment, consequences, even hellfire. Just turn to any red-letter edition of the Bible and you'll discover that Jesus' ministry includes a good dose of holy anger. I remember long ago listening to a counselor describing most anger as a cover emotion for fear and hurt, and that we would do well to get in touch with those underlying feelings before letting loose. And I've discovered the truth of that all too often. The counselor also talked, though, about righteous anger, which arises in the face of injustice, that provides energy for challenging the status quo when it is oppressive, energy for speaking up on behalf of the poor, the marginalized. There's power in righteous anger. Just witness this cleansing of the temple. However, I've discovered that this angry energy for justice also needs to be carefully channeled, focused on creative ends, in the full knowledge of our own mixed motives. For angry righteousness, including our own, maybe especially our own, is always relative, never perfect. So here's a powerful story about Jesus using anger to challenge what has gone wrong in the religious system surrounding the Jerusalem temple. Stop making my father's house a marketplace, Jesus shouts. Now, we need to be very careful not to slide into a too easy anti-Semitic critique of Judaism, bad temple, good Christian church. I think Jesus is denouncing all the various ways that we humans co-opt religion for less than spiritual purposes, pointing out how easy it is to lose sight of what temple and church, worship and prayer are all about. I can think of a number of ways where our own denomination, perhaps with the best of intentions, has gone terribly off track. Just think, for instance, of residential schools. And maybe in our times, Jesus' words need to be understood not only as a critique of the distortions in our church practices, but also as a stinging rebuke of the ways in which we have turned God's larger home, creation itself, into a marketplace. We are willing to sell and buy anything and everything in order to make a profit. Oil, cod, forests, and there will be judgment. Not an angry God raining destruction upon us, but rather the consequential judgment of, well, environmental pollution or global warming. So what would zeal for God's house look like today? How, for instance, is God's anger and deep concern for home being expressed in and through environmental activists? Is Naomi Klein, in her book, This Changes Everything, a prophetic voice, like Jesus? Now, in the Synoptic Gospels, this overturning the tables of the money changers becomes the trigger for plans to eliminate Jesus. But John moves the scene in a different direction. When Jesus is asked to explain his actions, when he's asked for a sign, he responds very strangely. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus' listeners think he's speaking of the literal temple, which has taken 46 years to build. But I wonder if Jesus is challenging the place of the temple in the religious practice of his people. 
He's messing with the assumptions of his listeners, trying to decenter them. It's not the building that is important, he says, not the rituals, the sacrifice, not the tradition, not the implied permanence and power. Rather, it's relationship with God that is at the heart of it all. That's what's important. That's home. Perhaps this is a word for us as a denomination. We who are wrestling with the question of what it means to be church and our temptation to locate that identity too firmly in our buildings. Oh, I know how important our churches are, how they have so often become thin places where prayer and worship, tears and laughter have helped fill those spaces with spirit. But don't get too attached to church buildings, says Jesus. Despite all the memories and traditions, they will all disappear sometime, perhaps sooner rather than later. Remember, the essence of church is rooted in relationship with the resurrected Christ, who calls us to follow, to love one another, to tell the story and break the bread wherever two or three are gathered.